So with that, I will turn it, uh, well, I'll do an introduction to our keynote and then turn the stage over uh, to Dr. Laura Lunsford. Uh, she's a currently an evaluator with the National Science Foundation and was previously professor and chair of psychology at Campbell University, uh, where she still holds an appointment. Uh, she wrote the definitive handbook for managing mentoring programs and co-edited the SAGE Handbook of Mentoring, in addition to having published over 40 peer-reviewed articles, chapters, and books on mentoring and leadership development. Um, she's presented at countless conferences and symposiums. Um, the Department uh, of Education, National Science Foundation, Institute of Educational Science, uh, and many others. In 2009, she was awarded the International Mentoring Association Dissertation Award. Uh, she was previously a tenure assistant, excuse me, associate professor at University of Arizona and directed the Swain Center uh, for Executive Education in the Cameron School of Business, the University of North Carolina, Wilmington and served as alumni director at Duke University's uh, Fuqua School of Business and was the founding full-time director of Park Scholarships at NC State. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Laura Lunsford to the stage. We were gonna do a poll everywhere, but um, instead I'm just gonna ask you, can a couple of folks just sort of yell out, what do you think mentoring is? Teaching. Teaching. Helping. Helping. Guiding. Guiding. Supporting. Supporting. Nurturing. Nurturing. Promoting. Promoting. Any other words? Listening. Okay. Ah, thank you, who said that? We're gonna come back to that. Listening, I appreciate that. This is Australia, and for those of you who don't know, Sydney is here in the green area. And there I was about 15 years ago, knocking on the door of a senior scientist who I was going to interview as for part of my sort of mini postdoctoral experience um, that was funded by the National Science Foundation. My mentor in graduate school was trying to talk me into being a professor, and I said, absolutely not, and he recommended me for this opportunity and told me I needed to go to Australia where he had a colleague. So I'm knocking on the door, and as I'm knocking on the door, so my first interview, I was only a week over getting over jet lag, which is, you know, about 20, it's, I don't know, 13, 11, it's a lot of hours difference, so I was just getting over it, and I'm sort of still a little sleepy, and as I'm knocking, I realize on the door is a cover of The Economist magazine. For those of you who don't know, The Economist is a very prestigious weekly uh, magazine, it covers a lot of topics, and as I'm knocking, I'm realizing on the cover of The Economist is a photograph of the faculty member I'm getting ready to interview. Now, my husband will tell you that I'm an extremely calm, confident person, um, and he means it in a loving way, as in perhaps overconfident, even when I have no basis to be confident. <laughs> this is relevant in that all of a sudden, I'm looking at other things on the door, and I'm becoming very nervous. Why is this guy going to want to talk to me about mentoring? He's probably very busy, and part of why he's so successful is he doesn't have interviews like this. But as I'm pondering running away, he opens the door. We come face to face. He invites me in his office and he says, well now how's this going to take place? He was in biomedical sciences. He said, uh, do I just start talking and you take notes? And I said, well I'm you know, a social scientist and we have a protocol, I actually have a set of interview questions, but hey, your picture's on The Economist, so you can do whatever you want. You wanna start talking, I'll take notes. I interviewed 23 senior scientists in Australia because I was interested in how do they pass along what often is unlearned information, mentorship. We call them memes now, mentorship memes. How do they pass it along? And here's some of the things that these scientists said, and I interviewed both men and women. Uh, it was more the sort of the era of the God professor, or my advisor provided support, but it was very formal. Uh, maybe wasn't the easiest to work with, wasn't always available. The work I did there in Australia led to an article called Mentors, Tour Mentors, and no mentors. Uh, it ends up we can learn from bad mentoring experiences and it's often to do something different because you knew what you wanted to receive and you want to make sure that you give that to your students. Here's a definition of mentoring. If you're not familiar with this study, 
I recommend it to you as the first National Academies of Science report that also had an online element, an online portal. And for three years, we debated uh, how to define mentoring. So I was on this consensus study. And I point this out to you because I asked you sort of what you thought of as mentoring. And this is a really great definition grounded in the literature. And the things that are important are it's a working alliance. Both people have to really want to participate. I do give a lot of talks, including places where it's required um, or expected. And when people are not interested in those relationships, they find ways to opt out. And we will talk about that. But it's also very important to think about it's both personal and professional growth. I was at a conference last week on mentoring. We spend days discussing what's the difference between uh, peer mentoring, reverse mentoring, executive mentoring, all the different kinds of uh, coaching. How is that different than teaching? And there is a difference. Professional and professional, uh, professional and personal growth. And this career, you don't know what you don't know, so they help you navigate the unwritten things about a career and psychosocial support. That role modeling, uh, friendship, feeling, uh, things, some of the things that you talked about, guiding, supporting, listening is really important. We're going to talk about that. But the question is, what's optimal or effective? I used to ha I had this talk originally, optimal mentoring. Uh, unfortunately, I'm married to a professor. Um, and so we, we discuss that evening, like, what does it mean to be optimal? What does optimize mean? So here's some numbers. So I'm curious, what do you think? This has to do with graduate education. What does the number nine have to do with? What? Years to what? OK, not bad. Anybody want to add anything to that? Nine. It is the median years to graduation for PhD students uh, in the biomedical field. You're probably not going to know 1 to 2.5, but anyone want to hazard a guess? My high school students are like, are you Googling it like right now in your minds? Yeah. Um, and this is actually the improvement in biomedical areas that the number of years has reduced from 2012 to 2022. So it takes less time than it used to. So it used to be 11. So it used to be even more. Uh, now we're going to think for a moment about COVID. This was an interview, these last two statistics, during COVID for graduate students, again, in the biomedical fields. What do you think 67% refers to? Sleep deprivation? Oh, no, that would be 99% uh, <laughs> sleep deprivation. This is how many of them reported that COVID disrupted their research agendas. Two thirds. Two thirds of students. And that's up. That's up in 2022. From 2021, it was only about half, 48%. So the disruption has continued. The 2023 numbers aren't out yet. What do you think 53% refers to? You're disrupted in your research. What might happen? Uh, that's a good, uh, that's not a bad guess, but it's, it's close. Delay in time to graduation. So half of them feel their time is going to be late, delayed. So when we talk about optimal or effective mentoring, you know, what, what do we mean? Are we talking about time to graduation? Are we talking about research? Are we talking about how people feel? Are we talking about jobs they get? Here's some more information. Here's debt. I drew arrows. Um, actually, my field, psychology, uh, is towards the bottom. All, you know, very few have no debt. But in health sciences, a little over 50% have no debt. The others do. And in biomedical, um, science, actually, it's, it's a lot better than health sciences. So this is just, so when you think about time to graduation, it, it's tied to how debt and costs for people not to be starting jobs when it's taking a long time. This is time to degree. And again, these are improved. Lately, I've taken to Googling PhD programs in STEM. I'm actually interested. Are they advertising that you graduate in four years? Many of them talk about having a four-year curriculum, but occasionally they will talk that it might take a fifth year. But pretty much no one is advertising six years, and they're certainly not advertising eight years, which is health sciences, when we're talking about doctoral education. I, li I have a cartoon. I like this person a lot. I have one of him like switching heads with someone else, because sometimes I think that's what mentoring should be. If I could just give you my brain, 
then you don't need to ask me anything and have all my knowledge. That's sometimes what people feel it is. You're just passing knowledge around. But it is an exchange. And so when we talk about what does it mean to be optimal, well, it's relative to what? Is it time to degree? Student resources expended, faculty resources expended, especially when we talk about underrepresented faculty, they are often overtasked with mentoring uh, students who are from underrepresented fields. We call it a service burden. So what do we mean when we talk about optimal versus effective? I want to tell you a story about evocative environments. Uh, this is the Nobel Prize. And there is a sociologist who interviewed 48 of the living 53 Nobel scientists back in the 1970s. She was interested in the scientific linkages. In other words, how did they become the research become so interesting and eminent that they merited receiving the Nobel Prize. What she found had to do a lot with mentoring. She was not seeking to look at mentoring initially, but she interviewed them. She collected data about their publications, who they published with, where they went to school, who their mentors were, and some found some very interesting things one of which she calls evocative environments. Some people seem to create an environment in their research lab and, and <coughs> institutes and centers that generated far more eminent scientists than other labs did. In other words, they somehow created an environment where people learn to ask really important questions or pursue very interesting lines of research. And she found some interesting things out. Nobel scientists publish earlier and longer than a matched group of scientists. So she matched them with similar scientists who went to the same schools, who had um, some similar demographic characteristics. So they publish, so they start publishing earlier, they publish longer, they publish more frequently. So on average, at least one article a year, the most prolific at that time uh, was 12. We would blow that out of the water now. I mean, this is before typewriters and computers, right? I mean, you're, well, I guess you did have a type. Yeah, yeah, you type, but it was slow. So it's much easier to get things out much faster. So they published at least one a year. They collaborated a lot more, not a little, a lot more. And they collaborated with people who were not just in their uh, advisor's uh, reach. They collaborated with other Nobel laureates or people who became Nobel laureates. Who you surround yourself with matters a lot. They were also very selective in choosing, and these are her words, their master, what we might now call their advisor or their mentor. They were very selective and deliberate in who they selected. And then later, as they became professors, were very selective in who they decided to take on as students. I come to mentoring from gifted from working with gifted students. And it's sort of interesting that sometimes mentors, people think mentors pick, uh, or mentors pick their students, but actually mentees pick also. They think about um, where they want to go, or we should encourage them to do that if we want to promote eminence. Where is that trajectory going to take you next? So this idea of selectivity is something sometimes people don't want to talk about. Because obviously, if you have a very bright person, that person is going to be successful. Like many of the people in the Australian study, they were all eminent scientists, and some had much better mentoring than others had. You might still be very successful, but the question is how successful and how many people did you lose uh, if environments weren't as um, supportive. They also had this um, other interesting finding. She called it noblesse oblige which is 26% of their papers later in their career, they were first author on. Compared to other people, later scientists, they, they were first author on over half of their papers. In other words, they would say things like, I don't need this recognition anymore. I still want to be on the work. I've contributed to the work. But this person needs the first authorship more. It's going to help their career. They recognized that. And they were willing to support and sponsor their mentees in this way. Another very interesting book is Good Mentoring. This is by Nakamura. She's out of Claremont. And they, too, have studied what does it mean to be uh, effective mentoring? How do you pass these memes along in terms of mentorship? And they also looked um, in great detail at some lineages, including biomedical professors. And she found that the environment also mattered a lot. 
And supportive environments matter, particularly in terms of they felt that mentors who invested intellectually and in the social and emotional aspects of their mentees, they did much better than people who didn't. Then the people who, hey, they helped them, they helped them instrumentally, they might have filed plans, but they just didn't seem as invested or interested in their mentee. She also found some interesting things about negative environments. Um, and this is the day-to-day -day activity of uh, maybe people get frustrated and lose their temper. Or they publicly humiliate a student because they ask them something that they probably know they don't know. So these little everyday, um, we might also in psychology now almost call them microaggressions, especially if they had to focus on a particular characteristic of a student. That this created a climate where people didn't feel like collaborating or sharing ideas or be very motivated. I think these two studies are very interesting in that they suggest that environment matters a lot and that the lead of a center or research project sets that tone in how postdocs, trainees, or others are going to behave and bring people in. And being very explicit about how you expect people to behave is important because no one has a class. Does anybody have a class in mentoring? I think they're starting to do some training now. So I'm, I think some of you have done some summer. Anybody been to a class? You did? Did you have a whole class? This is in our training. Okay. Hmm. I would, I would call that training, not a whole, like, like, nobody in graduate school goes to, like, they don't get a one-credit mentoring class, although they have it for teaching for some people. They have some teaching. Yet I would suggest that mentorship is a skill, and the more we can be explicit about what is important and recognized is something to be much more intentional about. And I hope that's one of the points you leave with today, is being intentional about what you want that environment to look like. Here's some more memes. Uh, this is uh, working from home in 2020, in March 2021, we got a beard going on, and now here, you know, th I just took a remote position. I feel like I put a door, on a sign on my door. I, my husband, my children are all gone. Do not disturb, I'm on a tight schedule today. He still knocks. He's like, who's this sign for? <laughs> it's for you, you're the only other one. So, COVID and some of this move to remote and hybrid work has made it even more difficult to pass by and have hallway conversations and to meet people. And especially for young people, I observe, it even feels a little challenging just to have a conversation in person or call someone up um, and talk about things that might have to do with their careers. So what are some examples about what we mean when we talk about a supportive environment? Because there are some very specific behavioral things that are meant here. Sometimes, especially when I talk to scientists, they think I'm going to be the touchy-feely, I'm Southern, female, psychologist. Tell me how you're feeling about that. This is sort of the, the stereotype. And that's not at all what is meant about mentoring. There are some very specific things. And one of those has to do with emotional safety, that people feel the mentor is non-judgmental. And mentors often think that they are non-judgmental, but they are perceived as being very judgmental. And so thinking quite deliberately about how to do that, I've learned to say things like, I'm not upset. I'm not frustrated. I'm just trying to understand your thinking here. Because otherwise, students don't know how to interpret or they interpret questions as being evaluative. Um, that mentors give time to think and support. This work also comes out of Nakamura's work from Good Mentoring for residents in particular in healthcare situations. That there's some responsiveness and feedback, that there's some time. I'm not going to read through all of these. You can kind of get the idea. But they're very behavioral items that point to the behaviors that matter in setting a climate and also help people who are going to be in these situations have some expectations. I've been at a lot of institutional types. And when I was at um, one university that was research intensive, I had one of my graduate students, um, I mentored a lot of students who were uh, underrepresented. Um, I had a first generation and a Hispanic student who came to tell me they found out that other doctoral students had nicknames for them. This was very concerning to me. Um, so I spoke with a faculty member in charge of the program. They hadn't really heard about this. I coached my mentees on how to address that with those students. And it led to a big faculty meeting of people who are psychologists. So think about this. Psychologists are supposed to think about human behavior. And yet, to a person, they all went around and were like, my student would never do that. When obviously their students had done some of that, and I knew exactly who they were, but my mentees had asked me not to say. So often things are going on, and we can just sort of overlook. 
Um, or think about, well, but people are being treated with respect, but if they're not, and there's very specific things, it's important to have those conversations to address them. Here's some developmental behaviors. I read the, the plans that you have, IRD plans. Um, and it's interesting, as I've been thinking a lot about mentoring lately, there's what I would call, you're sort of in health fields, the phenotype and genotype. Can you tell me what the, that means? They're like, what? Phenotype is physical and genotype is in your genes. All right, I'm, yeah, I'm good with that. So I think there is a genotype of mentoring. There are some fundamentals, and this is what they look like. But the phenotype, how it's going to express itself in that particular setting might be different. I know when I first started this um, inquiry into mentoring back in the 90s, I would sit around with my advisor and we would talk about that. Is mentoring different in physics than it is in, say, biomedical fields? Is it different in psychology than it is in education? Um, and I think we're, we're pretty well answering now, well, there is a there is that genotype and it's not different, so their psychological safety is important. What that's going to look like in a particular setting might vary. And there are resources that get at the behaviors and it's not just sort of hand-holding and, and um, listening. Then there's the idea about identity. Here's me when I was at University of Arizona. You can probably tell a lot about me. I'm in the front um, in this picture. I'm a pretty expressive person. I'm from the South. People in Arizona, anyone here from Arizona? They don't smile there, like a lot. You know, women don't. It's too hot. It, it is, it is hot. In the South, women are socialized to smile even if they're very upset and angry. And I had other women faculty say, I know you were very upset, but why are you smiling? And I'm like, because I can't help it. I, like, I know that I'm not supposed to, but you know, my mother's like, honey, you know, flies. They like honey better than, you know, okay. <laughs> Catch more flies with honey. People talk a lot about identity. There's a lot of terms being thrown around in terms of cultural competence or cultural humility. I'm more on the cultural humility side. I'm not sure how far cultural competence gets us. I'm first generation. No one will know that looking at me. I'm an extremely white person with blue eyes, and I have married into an extremely international family but they don't know that looking at me. And so there's a lot of things that can be hidden. I'm visually impaired, actually. Um, I'm legally blind in one of my eyes. People don't know that just looking at me. I've worked with um, a lot of people with visual impairments, and it's sort of interesting. Like, I have a colleague who, he can make a conference call faster than I can, and he can't see. I'm trying to get him to teach me. Like, how do you do that so fast? So when we talk about differences in terms of identity, there's some that are visible and some that are not. And in mentorship, this actually becomes really important if it gets in the way of the relationship. And the literature says that actually these things don't matter when we look at quantitative studies. That it doesn't matter if a woman has a male mentor. In fact, some studies suggest it's better if you have a white male mentor. Does anyone know why? Connections. Say more about that. Yes, they have more power, typically. They're higher up, and so they're able to do more sponsorship and open the door than other people. So actually, in terms of outcomes, it looks better, which sort of flies in the face sometimes of what people want to think about um, might work for matching. But the qualitative studies where people just talk to people find that actually sometimes those things matter a lot, that maybe uh, women want to talk to some other women who navigated having a family and a career. Or maybe um, African-American man wants to talk to another African-American to talk about how they're perceived in terms of assertiveness in a particular setting. My take on all this is that for those who didn't work it out in the beginning, they didn't stay in the studies long enough to make it into the quantitative studies. So if the relationship breaks off, they weren't able to look at, well, what were the outcomes? Did you get promoted more, make more money, et cetera? So the findings are very mixed. And it's hard to know. I've worked with women uh, scientists, for example. I had a very talented young woman. She went to Stanford, especially when I ran the scholarship program. She called me one day. She hated her mentor. Like, he was the best in the world at what he did. She's like, I can't stay working with him. Like, well, let's talk about sort of what's, what's involved. And we talked about some resources. There was one for women physicists. She's like, I don't want to be a woman physicist. I want to be a physicist. Other women are very happy to be connected with women physicists. 
The thing is, we don't know if we don't ask. And so part of my message about identity is to learn, especially in those initial conversations, um, to ask about what is it I need to know about you that I don't know? What's not obvious that would be helpful for me to know about you? And for me, it's often I'm first generation, so I didn't quite get the rules, and I do things like this when we take pictures. <laughs> I'm like, rules are guidelines. I had to sort of figure that out. People will tell you. And people don't ask. They like to do the anonymous surveys. And the problem with those are then people are just looking at the negative comments trying to figure out who said it. I once went to a university and I realized as an African-American uh, graduate dean, and I realized after the first session, the reason he brought me in, like he knew all the things that I was going to say. He needed a white person to say them to the white faculty members. Because they were all doing these surveys. And I'm like, have any of you ever asked your graduate students, like, how's it going? What can I do differently or better for you? So having times to check in uh, is really important, especially when we talk about issues of identity. I want to touch on a few things to give some time for questions. Um, high quality, I'm going to talk about this in my workshop. High quality isn't that you like the person necessarily, but that there's tensility. That if I give you negative feedback, and frankly in mentorships there should be some critical feedback, or it's not really as good a mentorship as it could be, but I still want to come back and talk to you. But after I redline some of my students' stuff, they still, you know, they slink out and they're going to go work on it, but they'll come back. This is tensility. Openness is the idea that you're going to connect people with new ideas and other people in your network. Sometimes people tell me that they have like five mentors, but they're all in the same department with the same view. I'm like, you have one mentor, really. So having a people that connect you with people you don't know and ideas you haven't thought about is a hallmark of effective mentorship. And finally, emotional tone, which took me a while to buy into this. One of my mentors uh, is a, a psychologist at the Naval Academy of all places. He does a lot of work on mentoring, and he's, he's much more like touchy-feely than I'll ever be on my best day. But he brought me in on emotional tone when I worked on a, a group that was um, nationwide. We came together every summer for three summers for one week to work on some, some work in mentorship. And we all, we didn't really know each other. But the idea of emotional tone is that we have some emotional connection. So we decided to do this by setting up a folder, and we would drop pictures of our successes in there from time to time, just to share with the group. During this three-year period, everyone got promote, promoted, two people got married, some people had children. And what we found was my group was the most productive group that they'd ever had at any of these three-year um, institutes ever. And in part, I think it was because this emotional tone, because I knew what was going on with you, that you felt comfortable saying to me, hey, I can't deliver on this deadline. Could we pass it to somebody else and then I'll take it? We were much more willing to communicate and have some trust that the person had the good intent, rather than just sort of not getting to it and not letting people know. So this idea of emotional tone, you can express the positive and negative, is also an important hallmark. I'm going to skip to here some recognized uh, dysfunction. Dysfunction does occur. We think it occurs in about 15% of mentorships. And the top two are the top at the top, neglect. Neglect is I take a phone call while I'm talking to you. I miss an appointment because I'm busy or maybe I overbooked. But this feels like neglect, that you're in disinterest. When I was in Arizona, we worked with a number of students, one who's now was on a project of mine actually as a graduate student. But he's an undergraduate at the time, Navajo. Um, some Native Americans find looking directly at someone as disrespectful. So they don't look, but then the mentor can perceive that that is disinterest. So this idea of neglect really gets in the way and derails relationships. Mismatch, I'm expecting something that you don't have competence in. So this is another reason people just don't want to engage. All the way down, I'm, there's a book I want to write called Tour Mentors. I have some really good stories. Uh, no one wants to put their names to them yet, so I'm having to sort of sort out how I'm going to do that. There are people who are manipulators. They take credit for people's work, or they talk about people in the lab or try to tear them down. Um, and this also can really derail mentorship. My message here is recognize and reduce them. These things aren't going to change quickly. So in the case of my student from Stanford, I helped her figure out to navigate to another mentor, but still maintain, have a graceful exit and have some connection with the other person. So figuring out how just to exit, because sometimes people think, well, it's going to get better, and it really doesn't. I think we can do better. And I encourage people to think about, especially if you're running mentorship, is have some data that you can look at on a regular basis. 
Um, talk to students and actually talk explicitly about mentoring. How's it going? I call it a, there's an exercise called plus delta. What do you want more of? What do we need to do differently next time? Kind of quick conversation at the end of our mentorship meetings. Um, and number three, I think is increasingly important as I have gone up in the academy, is having uncomfortable conversation with colleagues. Because sometimes we see some things that are going on and we're wondering about them, we don't know for sure, but even the perception of favoritism, um, other sort of un inappropriate behaviors are important, and so just being able to have some conversations about that. Especially when we have mixed gender relationships, attraction happens. It's a natural human thing. The problem is if, and acting on it. So, but having those conversations with a colleague about, I think this might be happening, or my mentee might be misinterpreting, how can I better manage that? So I would really encourage you to think about that. Invite leaders to celebrate good mentoring. You're doing a lot of that today. You have a whole conference on mentorship. Um, and engage in sponsorship, which is especially important for women and underrepresented populations. Um, we don't put them out there enough for activities, and that's actually a very important part of mentorship. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to, I don't know, do you want me to do the last slide or take questions? I have, I have a quick Let mention. Let me check the clock. Go ahead and do the last slide. Okay. Who's familiar with the Center for Open Science? Are you using it for mentoring at all? I would encourage you to uh, think about this. So the Center for Open Science, it started out as psychology. There's a replication crisis. So there's a place you can act. It's for free. You can pre-register your studies, and some journals are actually requiring that, at least in my discipline, uh, that you say sort of, here's what I think my hypothesis is going to be, et cetera. Um, here's a, a website for it. And, but it has some really nice infrastructure for mentoring. So you can have it be public. Some things can be public. You can put your papers, get a DOI, which is awesome. We issue a lot of reports. We'll put them out with a DOI. But it has things that are public to the group, your group, but private to others. I use the wiki and some other files. So this is sort of our lab meetings and my lab coordinator, she'll sort of, here's what's going on. The nice thing about Center for Open Science Infrastructure is it preserves that then as you get new students in. They can get some learning about like, oh, here's what this needs to look like. Here's what it looked like when the person started out versus when they got finished in terms of their individual development plan. So I just sort of mentioned that as a nice resource so you don't have to figure out maybe where it's living um, because this just sort of stays in archives there. Uh, and then if you have some things that you really like, you might publish an individual mentoring plan. So we, we keep a lot of information there. Uh, last night at dinner, we talked about Taylor Swift. I became curious. Uh, <laughs> after this, I like to collect songs I have to do with mentoring, and I've decided her Shake It Off. I listened to it a couple times last night, so I'll just sort of end with that. I think great mentors help their mentees shake off sometimes to difficult situations. Difficult, bad, is much more memorable than good. Um, and actually, there's a number of interactions. Does anybody know about this positivity ratio? How many good positive interactions you need? Yeah, you got the number. You need like seven to ten positive interactions for every one Well, three to five. Depends on the, you were very close. You need three to five. So if somebody has a really negative experience, they get burned by that and want to enact on that, which is the worst thing to do. Um, but you need three to five positives. So listen to some Taylor Swift to shake it off um, any of the haters. All right, we have some time for maybe a couple of questions. Yes? For approach, approaching an internship or mentorship? OK, that's a great question. How do you uh, advise to approach a mentorship? Well, you know, can we repeat the question? So that yes. Her question was, what's the advice to how to, for a younger person, how to approach a mentorship, especially if you're not sure about it, right? Is that what you're asking? Sometimes treat, people treat mentoring like, uh, I think of it like marriage. You know, on the first date, I'm not saying, let's get married, right? So some, sometimes people come and say, hey, will you be my mentor? Well, I don't know if I want to be your mentor yet. So I would say conduct information interviews. Approach it more from an informational interview, ask them what do they like about their career, not like, and advice they might have from you, and then stay in touch. Write them and thank them. You know, let them, hey, I'm thinking about this, are you aware of any opportunities? And then that naturally can evolve into a mentorship. There's also formal programs, which might be a little bit different. They did some speed mentoring up there today, which I really like that idea because it lets you meet different people and see who you might connect with. 
I would add to that. Um, if you're reaching out to somebody, let them know that you are meeting with several people, that you're not necessarily committing to that one person because sometimes then that mentor thinks, oh, well, I'm going to have this person work with me. So sometimes just letting them know you're meeting with several people before making a commitment. Yeah, terrific. Other questions out there? Thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering, especially in my graduate program, uh, it seemed that having one mentor was probably enough for most people. How, in your experience, has having multiple mentors helped people in their development? That's a great question. Um, some economists actually did some interesting research, and it looks like the optimal number, we call them developmental networks, are, are to have four. Um, and you would want somebody who's senior to you in your institution and somebody senior to you outside of your institution. You can meet them at professional conferences. Um, to have somebody at your same level, again, in your institution and at another institution, because especially if you stay in the academy, you need letters uh, for promotion and tenure. But if you move into the world of work, it just sort of helps you understand and get different perspectives. Um, a fifth is often recommended if there's some demographic characteristics that's important to you that your mentors don't share. So these don't all have to be deep mentorships, but they're more, we think of them as developmental relationships to again, give you some different perspective. For example, when I was in graduate school, my advisor was great at grant writing, not as great as publishing. So I sought someone out to help me with that skill. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for such an engaging um, presentation. The definition that you put up at the very beginning for mentorship um, had the word relational in it. And um, my quick read was that the implication was that there was benefits to both parties. Um, is there any research that looks at what percentage of mentors view mentorship as a burden as opposed to something that they benefit from? And has anybody explored the benefits of mentorship? Yes, actually, that's a great question. I don't know that they've done the study on viewing who, the percentage of people, how they view it. Um, but actually, I co-authored an article on a typology of mentoring costs. We would call that costs. And there are costs to mentoring, burdens. For faculty especially, if they feel overworked, and it's not in their, um, I've read a lot of tenure uh, manuals and handbooks, if they don't feel that it's part of their job, they often feel that it's an extra add-on burden they don't have time for. So it's certainly very important to align mentorship with the expectations of organizations and make that clear. Those should be clear in performance reviews, et cetera. But the fact is, a lot of people get promoted. Some of the benefits are you're seen as somebody who can mentor and coach others. <laughs> So that's a very important benefit. And then the socio, sort of emotional, psychosocial benefit is leaving a legacy. This feeling that you're giving back is um, very meaningful to people as they move into later aspects of their career. And what I call some stealth benefits, especially when working with underrepresented populations, is people kind of tune out if they have to go to some sort of diversity workshop. But when they have relationships, um, they learn a lot. We've actually had faculty say, wow, I learned a lot about um, maybe first generation students I didn't know, and so I've changed some of how I interact with my other students. So what we call, I call it sort of some stealth uh, benefits as well. But type, I'll send you that article, the typology of mentoring, because it outlines sort of some costs and, and burdens. And faculty sometimes do perceive it that way. I think we are out of time. Okay, yes. Yeah, I, I was just wondering if you could comment briefly on the value of peer mentoring or near peer mentoring and how you might set that up in terms of best practices. Peer mentoring is getting a lot of popularity and the research on peer mentoring says they often do too much psychosocial and not enough career. So I would say uh, for peer mentoring, it's really important to think about um, preparing people to have more conversations also about career opportunities and taking risks and how to um, build confidence to be able to do that. Women also tend to provide more psychosocial support and less career support, which is really problematic if you're a women mentee, woman mentee with a woman mentor. So often with train, formal training, we talk a lot about how women need to do more to provide that career support. Uh, and then men of female mentors need to do more to do sponsorship. 
Thank you, you've been really terrific and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to visit with you this morning. Oh, we had a little Taylor Swift. Oh, we, I even had a whole Taylor. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Linsford, so much for uh, stimulating kind of and starting us off uh, with our symposium and, and thinking about mentorship and what do we do better as a mentee and what do we do better as a mentor. So thank you so much.